Thank you for tuning in to A16Z's discussion on the future of esports. My name is Bennett Carroccio. I'm a partner in the consumer investing team at Andreessen Horowitz. And before we tune into a conversation on esports with my colleagues Frank Chen, Andrew Chen, and Darcy Kulikin, I will first be introducing you to this exciting global phenomenon. So if you're watching this, you probably at least already suspect that esports is a big thing. Well, perhaps you don't know just how popular this industry has become. In 2017, there were 335 million known viewers of esports content around the world. One year later, that number grew 18% to just shy of 400 million views, and in 2019, the global esports audience base grew another 15% and surpassed 450 million viewers. Now, assuming a 14% annual growth rate beginning in 2017, which is conservative by the way, we can expect around 650 million global esports viewers by 2022. So what are people watching? Well, using Twitch's top streamed games as a proxy for general consumption, we're seeing a lot of Battle Arena and Battle Royale titles like Riot's League of Legends, Epic's 2018 sensation Fortnite, and EA's 2019 sensation Apex Legends. So today, the main reason for the rapid audience growth is that this truly is a global phenomenon. Today, North America only represents a mere 12% of total enthusiasts, while close to 60% of fans are actually in Asia Pacific, with large concentrations in China and Korea. And despite North America lagging far behind Asia in audience size, esports league viewership is already about the average size of the four largest North American sports leagues. If you compare each league's audience size with esports, esport leagues had a larger audience base than both Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League in 2017. If you look at just the finals for each of the leagues, the League of Legends Championship alone drew in more total viewers than baseball's World Series, basketball's finals, and hockey's Stanley Cup in 2017, second only to the Super Bowl. Now, it's worth noting that the top traditional sports leagues in North America do have global appeal, but are mostly regional in nature. Esports, on the other hand, is truly global because there are no limitations to participation. The world is entirely online and therefore not confined to sports-specific physical spaces like a soccer field or a tennis court. When you think about more global sports like soccer, which has billions of viewers, you start to realize how big of an opportunity esports can be. And so despite all the industry's exciting momentum, monetization in esports still lags far behind traditional sports. Now we love to drill down on unit economics here. So excluding England's Premier League, North America's top leagues are the most highly monetized in the world on a per-fan basis. On average, the top four North American sports leagues drove in $54 of revenue per each individual fan in 2017. Esports today is about 7% of that, or $4 in revenue per fan. And so while revenue per fan remains early, monetization historically always follows eyeballs. This year, global revenue will surpass $1 billion, having been less than half a billion a mere three years ago. That's a 30% CAGR over the last three years, which is extremely exciting. Now, if you assume revenue continues to grow at a lower rate of, say, 20%, global revenue will surpass $1.5 billion by 2021. That implies 3x industry growth in just five years. And so revenue today, where is it coming from? Well, right now, a combination of media rights and sponsorships accounts for roughly 65% of total industry revenue, while advertising, merch, ticket sales, and publisher fees represent the remaining 35%. The 22% of total revenue for media rights comes mostly from esports leagues selling broadcasting rights to major media outlets. The biggest example of this is Twitch's broadcasting deal for Overwatch, where in 2018, Twitch paid Activision Blizzard $90 million to broadcast the Overwatch League's first two seasons. And then there are sponsorships, which accounts for 42% of total revenue and is growing 30% each year. As esports continues to penetrate the cultural zeitgeist, well-known, non-endemic brands are slapping their logos on each level of the competition. Brands like MasterCard, Universal, and Coca-Cola sponsor the leagues for games like League of Legends, Overwatch, and Call of Duty, while others like Red Bull, Adidas, and even the United States Air Force are sponsoring teams like Cloud9, TSM, 100 Thieves, and Team Vitality. So to wrap up, the key takeaway and cause for excitement over here is that esports is capturing the world's attention while monetization remains nascent. So with that in mind, let's tune into a conversation with my colleagues Frank Chen, Andrew Chen, and Darcy Kulikin, who are beginning to discuss the why now around esports, and we'll wrap up with identifying opportunities for startups within the esports ecosystem. Enjoy. Hi, this is Frank Chen. Welcome to the A16Z YouTube channel. Today we've got a fun conversation about what's happening in our culture around esports. 
And to set the context, look, computer games have been around since the beginning of computers. We had Space War in the 1950s. We got to Pong in 1970. We got to Pac-Man in 1982. And at some point, we realized that video games was generating more revenue worldwide than movies. So by, 19, or by 2014, uh, gaming revenue was at $80 billion, twice the worldwide global box office take. But today I'm here with my partners Darcy Kulkan and Andrew Chen, and they think something qualitatively different is going on around esports. So it's not just video games are big, we've known that for a while, but something culturally relevant and different. And what's happening? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's, I think what you're seeing in the last couple of years is that esports, esports particularly, I think gaming more broadly, has really kind of become a part of our kind of cultural zeitgeist, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. It's become a part of the like cultural connective tissue. So if you think about it as, there's, there's a few different types of like junctions or like hubs or like kind of areas that we come together on, we debate, we talk about it. You think about it like music, mm -hmm. uh, movies, television, mm -hmm. sports, like traditional sports. They're these kind of places where like our culture comes together and, and interacts. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've seen in the last few years is gaming and kind of through the manifestation of esports has kind of become that as it's continued to grow it's become one of these things that is it's just core to to especially to a particular generation it's mm -hmm. core to that kind of interaction um you know you see drake and ninja playing mm -hmm. each other that's like this like coordination of popular culture and this kind of like gaming mm -hmm. culture you're seeing like traditional athletes and celebrities using video games using streaming using all of these channels as a way to kind of connect with their audience some of it genuine some of it not genuine but mm -hmm. you know they see the opportunity and they see this overlap happening mm -hmm. and you just see it in the numbers you see it in you know there is a hundred million you know a hundred million concurrence in you know certain esports events there's like 10 million concurrence for Wimbledon you know the viewership of Esports more broadly rivals that of the big four sports. Um, so you know you're seeing it in the numbers, you're seeing it in some of the qualitative stuff, you're seeing it in where a bunch of this overlap is happening, and it's really you're seeing gaming and esports become like another vector in this cultural zeitgeist. Mm. Yeah, and, and and I think you know uh, the, one of the other things that is is super obvious and interesting about all of this is around the um, the, the demographics and the age. Yeah. Of of the of the players versus you know the viewers of a lot of these um, you know sort of traditional sports. I think if you look at um, you know baseball, it's like you have the audience that is you know now in their kind of like late fifties. Um, you know NFL, you know NBA's. I think like you know really young at you know forty two or something right, like that right, is kind yeah, of the yeah, average right. age. And so then you know all of a sudden you look at um, you look at gaming kind of, again more broadly. And so you know you you'd add. Minecraft and Roblox in there, which are very streamable. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're they're uh, they're obviously not not competitive. There's no tournaments or whatever around them. Um, you know, and and then Fortnite, and then kind of as you're leveling up and aging, and um, you know, one of the first things that you realize is like, wow, um, by the time that you're 18, you know, maybe you've been playing you know video games for for a decade mm -hmm. of your life, which is you know like amazing. And so then that just sets up, I think, the the the, the next. You know your 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 twenties <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to really you know dig in right, and, yeah. and 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 really be interested in that and and I think you know one of the one of the um, analogies I've heard uh, you know about esports and, and some of the tournaments is that it's kind of like the Olympics in many ways right it's the yeah. thing that um, when it's going on it sort of completely you know dominates the airwaves it sort of is this thing you know as you were saying it's, it becomes part of the zeitgeist um, you know and all the while at the same time. There's all this sort of like background engagement that's just you know happening day in and day out. You know that that that's that's super interesting. And so I think as we're seeing the demographic shift, um, you know, you end up with all the all the sort of millennials. Uh, you know, I, I'm like a late millennial, and yeah. so you know, like I grew up in the age of you know the Nintendo console first coming out. But you're going to start getting um, you know really interesting group of of adults who. Uh, they their their primary form of entertainment by hours through their the, you know all of growing up all of you know getting into their twenties is going to be gaming not all, all the other forms of entertainment. I, I think it's interesting because one of the explanations I've heard for kind of like why now and like why this is something that that's taking off now is that it's actually the same thing that's been happening over and over and over again. Like this happened in the seventies, it happened in the eighties, it happened in the nineties. It's just like every time it got a little bit bigger. And it's like, you know, the kids who grew up playing games in the 70s might have been a minority of people. In the 80s, it was a little bit bigger. The 90s, a little bit bigger. And every generation that came along 
it's kind of snowballed a little bit more, a little bit more, and now you've hit this kind of tipping point, right? right? You've hit this point now where it's like, it's no longer this niche group, it's now part of the cultural mainstream, and that, and you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why it kind of potentially happened now, but you could also just make the argument that it, this was just a natural, a natural inflection point yeah. where it did get big enough that you had to do it. Although one of the things that feels qualitatively different is how much it's a spectator sport, mm -hmm. right? So if you thought about video games traditionally in sort of console days or sort of the handheld days, it was sort of single player, multiplayer, yeah. or you'd have a group of yeah. like kids clustered around the console, yeah. right? But now we've got 100 million concurrence in the same way that uh, there are people watching live sports events like the Super Bowl or the World Series. Mm -hmm. So that feels qualitatively different. Like why is that happening now? Well, I think, I mean, I think one part of it is just game design. I think mean, mm -hmm. game design has become more social. I think one part of it is maybe a little bit technology. It's become easier just to kind of do these things in a distributed fashion. Right. You can play phone, right. you can play games on your phone. Yeah. You know, I think you now know, any 10 year old can set up their PC to stream. Exactly. Right, to, yeah. to reach a, a mass audience. Exactly, right. exactly. So I, I think part of it is that. Um, you know, I think that that's kind of like a big driver of how this has become much more social. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think another part of it is that it's just become more you know, you almost want to do it, you have to do it, right? right. If your friends are doing it, yeah. then right. you want to do it. Right. And so, you know, the, the, the other angle to look at this from is, um, is video, right? Mm -hmm. Just the proliferation of the video platforms. Yeah. You're now in a world where there's billions of people across multiple platforms that, um, you know, wh whether, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Twitch, whether it's, you know, Facebook video, whether, you know, just all, all the platforms, where all of a sudden, um, you know, people can watch something that's entertaining, mm -hmm. and then they they get a, a, a ton of value just by watching. You know, I, I think a great example of this is uh, there's there's for example there's numerous um, YouTube channels where uh, it's it's targeted at kids mm -hmm. to just watch like little Kinder eggs, you know, with with a little toy inside get unwrapped, and these things have like you know millions of subscribers. <laughs> right. Right. Like. Right. And, it, and it's, it's, like it's a child it's super, unboxing yeah, video. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. No, no, that's what I was gonna say. So the funny thing about it is, on one hand, you're like. That's dumb, right? right? But on the other hand, I'm like, I'm gonna watch this unboxing video. Right. This is gonna be great, right? And so then I watch like The Verge, you know, or somebody, you know, do like a review, and I, and and, and I think I think the the you know so so my my long point there is basically that it turns out that watching somebody enjoy something, mm -hmm. it gives you like I don't know twenty percent of the same enjoyment yeah. as like actually getting it yourself, yeah. and then it just turns out that then watching people you know play. Um, you know, games. Uh, you know, also kind of is like, oh, I'm I'm kind of playing, but like I'm not really because I can still be texting or I can right. still be doing other things at the same time. Right. And so I think you know, it's almost sort of like first a accident of history that it, it turned out that certain kinds of you know games were more streamable, and the fact that Twitch like you know willed itself into existence from um, you know a very weird and you know horizontal like Justin TV kind mm -hmm. of history. Um, and, and, and I think what, what's happened now is, is now that this has, is very clearly a um, you know, major sort of like growth hack to be able to generate, uh, to, to make things that are streamable, mm -hmm. now I think you have to you know, almost work backwards, right? If you're working on a new, um, you know, if you're working on a new games property or you're working on a new, um, you know, something that plugs in, mm -hmm. you, you, you almost need to start with the question of, well, what's streamable, what's fun to watch, right. not just what's fun to play, but right. what's fun to watch. Right. And then that kind of naturally gets you, I think, to um, one of, one of you know, two things, and maybe, maybe we'll discover three or four or five things you know, coming up. One is, it's fun to watch because it's fun to watch people compete, mm -hmm. right? And there's winners and losers, and it has the sort of the same dynamics of, of sports, and so that's kind of what we, we were talking about. There's also an offshoot, which is it's fun to watch people be creative, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so just watching folks build like, you know, an entire like Game of Thrones city inside of Minecraft and like all the all the details and all that, you know, is in itself, you know, really, really fun. It's, you know, sort of more co-op than PvP and so, you know, has like kind of different dynamics. And I think we will over time find other aspects of this that are fun to watch. And it just turns out that the biggest one of these ends up being esports. And so, you know, that's the, the, the you know, but yeah, we, could, yeah. we could just as much be having this conversation right. yeah. about the second one, right? About sort of creative and artistic expression within, within yeah. these games, because there's certainly a, a, a few um, uh, things that are, that are letting you do that as well. And, and I think just on that, on that kind of esports, like esports as a vector into like why the growth has happened and why this happened now, I think you've had, you also had something where you know, a group of people came along and organized it, right? And gave it the, gave people the right incentives, gave people the mm -hmm. right permissions, 
create, gave people the right resources to actually create this kind of like esports infrastructure, mm -hmm. which then led to a huge explosion in esports audience, which then has driven a lot of gaming audience as well. So part of it is just kind of structural. And if you look on the flip side of that, you were talking about kind of like baseball and some of the traditional sports. They've, to a certain extent, been like caught in this kind of innovator's dilemma where the consumption patterns, like the things that a younger generation wants to watch, don't necessarily align with how they produce content or the content that they're producing, but they've got you know a bunch of baseball fans that you know are used to looking at watching things in a certain way, and you've got some companies like Overtime trying to do trying to fix that within the traditional sports realm, but esports and gaming just has such a huge advantage because mm -hmm. they're coming from a blank slate, right? And they're coming from an audience that that they can define how that consumption right, happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and 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 the games, uh, you know, the the sort of feedback loop between. Games, games design, game design, yeah. the developers, the publishers, yeah. and then what's happening, you know, within the community is something that you know, you, you can kind of run these experiments and kind of speed up the iteration, iteration cycle on it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's fascinating to go to, for example, a Super, Super Smash Brothers tournament yeah. and watch the whole thing kind of operated on you know what used to be kind of like a pencil and paper right. kind of thing, and just people just you know you play. And you know, play in front of these like CRTs because like yeah. you know you mm -hmm. actually need the, the timing down and all the yeah. all this other stuff. And then um, uh, and then after you're done, after you beat somebody, then you just you literally are just walk over, you know, it's sort of like sneaker net. You like walk over to your next opponent <laughs> and then play them, right? Right. And so you know, y so you have things like that going. You have now all of a sudden, uh, you know, th then you had sort of all, all the you know bottoms up kind of leagues and people trying to organize those. Um, you know, the, the, for example, the, the Dota ecosystem is, you know, much more kind of, quote unquote, unmanaged, right. you know, than the rest. And then you have, you know, Activision Blizzard and, um, you know, League, which are like at the forefront of actually having sort of publisher, game developer sponsored leagues and sort of creating the whole rule set around there and doing collective bargaining to get the media rights, uh, you know, payments up and like all these other sort of sophistication. So I think you're just seeing this rapid professionalization and sophistication there and then a lot of the talent is sort of moving from traditional sports into um, into esports in order to sort of supercharge the IQ, you know, w with, within all of this, which is which is super fascinating. We've 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 met a bunch of a number yeah. of teams as well, kind of you know, and 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 many of them are being led by super impressive people. I love this idea of sort of the new core competences that a game designer or a game publisher or a lead organi organizer needs to have, which is if you think about the shape of startups that are going to exist in this space. Like if you were a game designer before, you never worried about how is this going to play on caffeine and how do I maximize the uh, views on YouTube. But like that's getting baked into how you design the game. Like you can't design a game and not think about those things. Right, right? right. And then if you're a publisher, you can't not think about, well, how do I actually host and get people to meet and discover and right, uh, sort of find people to play with. And like that becomes part of the core confidence, right? right? It's not just like right. I stuff it into the channel. I've got to like right. operate this massive uh, yeah. concurrent online video platform. Yeah, right? and, 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 I, and I think you would actually argue that, you know, going back to some of your arcade examples right at the beginning, right? It's sort of like the core competency of an arcade game designer would have been, uh, it needs to be so engaging that, and, and, but crazy hard. Right. Um, so right. that you'll keep popping in quarters, right. and so um, you know, our arcade games were classically like incredibly, incredibly difficult right. compared to you know, like a lot of games now are like they're meant to be. Yeah. Um, you well, know, that you was sort of this exponential curve. Right. 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 Level yeah. twenty-seven of Pac-Man was yeah. much harder than level yeah. twenty-six. You know, versus you play you play uh, you know um, Red Dead Two or you know mm -hmm. something like that, and you're kind of like, oh, this is just like an experience. Like it's not meant to be hard. Mm -hmm. You know. Then you look at something. You know, I'll jump ahead a bunch of generations, but mm -hmm. you know, Facebook games were all about how do you create a game that um, is intrinsically viral mm -hmm. and so everything was like you can't do anything you you know you could play 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 you get to a certain point then you, you hit the kind of Zynga game mechanics in Farmville where it was like well in order to do this you need to ask your neighbor for things right. you know and then that would post right. onto their you know yeah exactly right sort of the, you know and then that was that and then you know mobile games you know the, all the iOS games have been about well it's always going to be sort of you know, paid install driven, so the monetization right. needs to be incredible, right? It needs to be free, and mm -hmm. then the monetization needs to, you know, you, you sort of are trying to capture this like mid core gamer where right. the, you know, monetization is huge, and so you can just keep buying the installs. And then I think, you know, each one of these platform shifts sort of leads to a new thing, and then mm -hmm. now the streaming platforms and video sort of implies, you know, to your point, that um, all of a sudden, you know, you have to think about and design your game, you know, differently. And so, um, 
you know, I, I think we're, we're well, we're, we're on the verge of also a bunch of kind of ideas similar to, you know, the, the sort of classic kind of Hunger Games, you know, type thing where you have, you have literally Battle Royale, which is yep. funny that, you know, Hunger <laughs> Games, like, popular as Battle Royale, and now, That's now, right. now, now, now in I game think, form. Yeah, now in game form. Uh, game form. Actually, you know, so someone was saying um, I, on Twitter that uh, the, you know, any game that, that can implement Battle Royale will now implement Battle Royale. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, but w one of the other aspects of Hunger Games that's super interesting is that, you know, if you remember, if you recall, um, the audience could, you know, sort of like donate some credits and then, you know, uh, like an item would come, you know, yeah. out of the sky and, you know, whatever. Obviously, there's a bunch of game balance issues and so on that need to be sort of figured out there. But, you know, sort of increasing audience participation yeah. is, is another kind of really interesting area. How, how do you make the audience part of the game? Right. This is like pretty, pretty interesting as well. And, right. and I think that's another place where gaming and esports has like such a huge advantage over traditional sports, mm -hmm. right? Like the idea right. of like, like the version you hear of this in the kind of traditional sports media ecosystem is like, oh, we're going to let gambling happen, right? right? And it's like, that's really the only way that, that fans can interact with a kind of brick and mortar sport, for lack of mm -hmm. a better term. Whereas if you think about esports, like, the, the possibilities are endless, right? right? Like, I, as a game designer, I can kind of integrate any different way that I want to. I can A-B test, I can try a whole bunch of different things, and, like, the, the like, solution set is just massive compared yeah. to traditional. So, like, another right. reason they're kind of advantaged in this world. Right. right. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see the creativity of game designers taking yeah. advantage of, look, we can harness audience participation, right? So, what's the digital equivalent of the wave or the cheer or the, right. the booing the visiting team, <laughs> right? And when do we actually get, you know, sort of items, health drops out of the sky because your crowd cheered loud enough or enough people said, yes, like, you know, yeah. send the health pack. Right. Um, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Well, and, and all the streaming platforms, you know, like Twitch recently um, announced their, um, they have a whole extensions platform, right, that, you know, so, so I think, I think it, this is all coming. It's just sort of like a matter of time. It's all inevitable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's think about the business of esports, right? So we're opening up all new opportunities. How do you think the existing value chains get reconfigured? What are the opportunities? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the big open question for like esports in particular. Um, you know, if you look at the audience and kind of eyeball numbers, they're you know the, you you see this massive trend off, like off the charts. Yeah, it's like you know it's it's I think it's like 150 million viewers on average, which is like basically somewhere on like the average of a big four sport. Like and, 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 and there's billions of gamers. There's yeah, literally there's billions, billions of gamers, gamers right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but if you look at the kind of monetization side of it, that's still lagging, right? So I think on the monetization side, they make like somewhere around like $4 per viewer. Mm. If you look at like the major league sports, they're making like $50 per right. viewer, right? right. And so, so order of magnitude jump. Yeah, so, so you know, and, and that will probably come. It's just what form does that come in? Like does that come in the form, uh, and, and like where does that value accrue to as well? Mm -hmm. So does that form come in like, Tickets? Does it come in merchandise? Does it come in media sponsorships or, or something like that? Or does it really just come in like game sales, mm -hmm. right? And and you know, does the value accrue to kind of the esports ecosystem? Does the value accrue to the publisher ecosystem? And kind of what does that look like going forward? So I think that's the big question, you know, for esports in particular. But I think it's also like everything with esports is related to the broader gaming question mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Is it safe to say at this moment in time, just looking at how the current economics? Uh, are playing out that it's kind of the publishers to lose, right? Which is like that's where uh, the publishers are capturing most of the value now, or is that under attack even as we speak? Well, so I think it's, I think the publishers will always have an incentive for the esports leagues to be successful. The question is if the esports leagues are too successful mm -hmm. to the publisher, you know, w w what does that relationship look like right. in, in like edge case scenarios, right? right. So there, there's a like right. very <laughs> symbiotic relationship between publishers and everybody else in a certain world. But then, you know, if we deviate from that world, then the question becomes like, you know, what happens right. then? Well, I, I think this is something that, um, uh, and, and we've, we've looked at a couple teams um, together on this, um, is that you, you can kind of argue either way. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's a world in which you know. Let, let me let me give the, the the bull case on on some of the teams and and, and mm -hmm. we can talk a little bit. So about this would be the, the investing in a team that plays League of Legends or Fortnite or whatever. Right. right. So well, that's I, well okay. Well, and, and that's that's part of the subtlety of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Is like these organizations they um, often own teams across different games. Got it. Right. right. And so un, which unlike you know the the ownership group for the Warriors and the SF Giants are you know right. like I'm sure there's some overlap but it's not distinct. Right. It's, it's you it's play one. 
it's not game. literally the you same. You field yeah. a team. You invest in a team. They play one game. Correct. Yeah. So, so in in, in the case of um, you know the, the the teams, the esports teams that that are out there, one of the interesting you know thoughts is, you know, on one hand, the 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 bear case would be okay. Yeah, the develop the the game developer they have they hold all the cards, and so that you know they're sort of collective bargaining on the thing. They can like they can you know they they can even nerf specific. You know, characters. They have like incredible control over the whole thing, and um, and you sort of you know, on one hand, you kind of like serve at their leisure, right? Mm -hmm. That would be one way to to, to read the situation, um, and and especially the, because the media rights are so important, mm -hmm. right? And because they set the league rules. You know, for instance, there are you know, in some cases, the, you know, folks will say, hey, you actually can't use the same name. You can't be like the San Francisco Giants that play base that plays baseball and football and mm -hmm. hockey because you know it, we want it to be just different different brands, right? Mm -hmm. you, they, they don't want to create too many. You know, there's situations like that where they can just write the league rules in a certain way. On the other hand, I think the the other argument would be, look, we're actually at maybe sort of the peak level of power concentration. You know, within these publishers, because um, you know, very quickly it, we we just had the league, and then we had Overwatch, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden Fortnite is like a whole other company. Right. You know, right. Epic has made that whole thing work, and then now Apex is like huge. You know, it's I think there are 50 million players yeah, 50 all of a million sudden in like a month, right? Exactly, yeah. right, in a very short period of time, yeah. and then you know, and then that's that's actually EA, mm -hmm. right? And so you know, maybe what happens is in fact. As all of the publishers all move towards building, you know, sort of the, this flavor of streamable game, that actually there are more and more there's more and more fragmentation of games, right? And the mm -hmm. overall market will be growing, but there's more fragmentation. And so, if that's true, I think what ends up happening is, you know, what, you, you could argue one of two things. So, I think one is that, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, as as a as a team owner, what that means is, um, you know, you, you have your choice of which. You know which which games you're gonna support, mm -hmm. right? And then the the second thing becomes, um, you know, uh, when before a new game launches, maybe you get to a state where a new game, de you know, developer is gonna be like, oh, I better go talk to all the, you know, sort of ownership groups of the teams and like get a whole thing set up mm -hmm. around the launch of my new game, and then like kind of do a thing, and then that way you can negotiate really favor, you know, then they're then then those guys are involved in writing the rules mm -hmm. of the league. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I think over time, if if that if you get to that level, you'll get to a point where um, you know the, the the talent ends up holding you know the cards mm -hmm. in, in the whole thing, and so um, so you know it, it could go either way, right? I mean, it's 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 still you know really early um, in in the whole ecosystem, so it, it'll it'll be cool to see how it all plays out. I, I think one of the interesting subtleties too on this kind of team organizational side as well is. There's different teams building different kind of core competencies. So some teams are very much um, making a bet on kind of brand merch. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're really trying to build lifestyle brands off of this kind of trend. Others are building more like events. You know, they they think that you know, mm -hmm. like like events, it's, it's and the live ticket sales, the right. live experience. That's what's going to really kind of where value. music is headed. Yeah, right. So, so you know, live events over sort of down. You know, sort exactly of yeah. buying CDs. Exactly. And so so you know, I think it's that's another level of subtlety between this kind of like these these teams is you know some are making they all kind of are 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 riding these trends that, that Andrew's talking about, but they're also making distinct bets in terms of how they think this ecosystem is going to play out as well. As you look into the universe of things that are investable in this super exciting space, you could invest in a publisher, you could invest in a league or a team, you can maybe even invest in an athlete, right, that has gotten a big following, you could invest in Ninja, or you could invest in sort of picks and shovels. So if you think about what happened in offline sports, you had ticketing companies, you had stats companies, you had analytics companies, and so picks and shovels types of yeah. investments. Is there a category that uh, both of you are sort of very excited about? Um, so, so I think there's opportunity kind of across the spectrum. I mean, I think one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time looking at and I'm kind of particularly excited about is these kind of infrastructure mm. picks and shovels plays. Um, everything that can help kind of drive increased engagement mm. and I think more and more increased monetization. Mm. So on the engagement side, you know, that, that's the things like the streaming platforms like Caffeine, mm -hmm. it's things that are making discovery easier, it's mm -hmm. things that are making like team management engagement, engagement with fans easier, yeah. even things like, you know, like Discord, you know, yeah. things like that that just make yeah. communication and connection easier. And then on the monetization side, because it's so early there, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for companies to, to figure out how to exist in that space and whether that, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways, whether it's like analytics, you know, whether it's 
you know, doing what Shopify did for e-commerce, doing what Patreon did for content. You know, there's a bunch of different models out there, and they're trying to figure out what works in kind of gaming and esports, and and who's the company that's going to be able to like get to market most most quickly and most efficiently in some of those places. Mm -hmm. The advantage of investing in picks and shovels is that you're not trying to pick a winner in in sort of games, and uh, you know, like right. games seemingly come out of nowhere these days. Uh, it was Fortnite, you know, a couple years ago, and then all of a sudden Apex Legends, right? Like out of nowhere, and so like the challenge is like, how do you predict that? Right. Um, right. So there's an advantage to sort of inducting in yeah. picks and shovels. Yeah. So you don't have to pick the winner. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I, I am very open to the idea of of backing teams that are actually building games and content. Mm. Um, I think if they have a unique insight about you know what what's going on. Right? So let, let me back up a little bit, which I think the the the. Esports is one aspect of, I think, a broader transformation that's happening in the games industry, right? You, you had a world where previously um, you would build a game, year one would be amazing, year two would be you know, much worse, year three was basically like obsolete, right? And, and, and this is a sort of like packaged yeah, rapid game decay. You know, world. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. right. And so all of a sudden, I think what's happened is um, esports and, and sort of this tournament play and you know, the competitive aspect, that's one version of this. Uh, being able to create a streamable thing, which then you know has a community around um, you know your whole product. That's another version of this, um, and and user generated content. You know the way that um, you know Roblox or mm -hmm. Minecraft or you know even even you know Second Life. You know back mm -hmm. back in the day, like mm -hmm. these sort of more virtual worldy kind of things. All three of these are sort of different flavors of how you bake network effects into. Um, what used to be a purely content business, mm -hmm. right? And so if you sort of have content, you have like the social aspect, you know, sort of baked in, and then you have these network effects that are driven by one of those three things. And it could be one of the three, it could be two of the three, it could be all three, right? Um, I'm sure there will be a um, competitive, but also streamable and also user generated thing somewhere like coming right. up, right? Yeah. Um, and, so, and so I think if, if a team spun out of um, uh, one of the top, you know, um, uh, you know, games communities or ecosystems, and wanted and had some special insight about one of these three, mm. or all three of the three. Fantastic! Mm. I would love to meet that team. So I think mm. I think that that's one kind of flavor of, of thing that I would be excited about. The other thing I would say though is, you know, it's we we have um, uh, you know, done so much investing kind of around. Um, th there's a term which is the you know everyone knows kind of B two B, everyone. Uh, knows also there, there's a thing called B2B2C, right. right? So it's like you partner with somebody and then that, and then they give you access to their consumers. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, um, you know, our, our, our friend Chris Dixon also likes to talk about the idea of um, B2D2C, which is uh, business to developer to consumer, mm -hmm. right? And that's something like Oculus where you're sort of betting on a team of developers to build the thing that then consumers will love, mm -hmm. right? Um, we also have an investment in, um, you know, Improbable, which sort mm -hmm. of is, is sort of like that. Um, you know, Sandbox VR, which is, um, you know, my first investment here at, here at the firm, sort of has a flavor of this and that they're going full stack, they're building the games, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But embedded within it is they're building a platform that kind of gets you there. Right. I think that's all really exciting because, you know, the, in, in the end, I think, you know, one of the reasons why um, game, games are so interesting is because it's software, mm -hmm. right? right? And you have these um, ecosystems of folks that are, you know, modding these games. Like, we sort of all know that, um, you know, League of Legends was, you know, sort of a derivative of, um, you know, Dota originally, mm -hmm. like, more polished, which was a mod on top of Warcraft 3. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and there's many, many games that sort of have this, you know, flavor. To it, um, and and also all, all, now all the battle royale games were actually part of you know like sort of successive mods as well, and so it's it's a really interesting world where there are makers, there are developers, there you know it's like it's a software you know thing, and so I think this so, sort of business to developer to consumer is is sort of an interesting play as well. Mm -hmm. Look at the top. We said video games are a big business already. Um, is something qualitatively different happening here, either culturally or with the business? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, to, to take it back to the top, I think where we started the conversation was that gaming and esports had become a part of the cultural zeitgeist. Yeah. I think when it becomes one of these hubs like music and movies and everything like that, it just becomes incredibly persistent and it becomes incredibly resilient and this now is, is teed up to last 
over generations, right? Yeah. We might not listen to the same music we listened to 50 years ago, but music is still a category. Same thing happened with TV, same thing with traditional sports, and I think what you're seeing with gaming and, and I guess esports, but, but probably like gaming more specifically, is it's now entering that like pantheon of cultural like areas yeah. that are now gonna exist like generation over generation over generation. Yeah, and anytime that happens in the culture where it becomes woven into the fabric and people talk about it, right? So uh, we already have the attention, yeah. right? And then the money presumably will follow, right? We'll yep. get from $4 RPU to $50 uh, RPUs. Um, right. Yeah. All right, well thanks guys for joining me on the A16Z YouTube channel. We're sort of fired up about esports as you can tell. I kind of think back to sort of, you know, think about sort of the skeptics uh, on gaming. People will never play video games for hours. People will never play games with their friends. People will never watch other people playing video games. People will never like pay to like watch other people play video games. And like, look, every successive wave of skeptics, uh, they've been overcome because this really is a mainstream phenomenon and something new in our culture and we can't wait to see how this all unfolds. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and subscribe. Leave some comments down below. What's your favorite game? And how do you think the business of esports is going to unfold? We'll see you next episode.